The Will by Hazard Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the Promised Messiah and Mahdi, founder of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. About the author. Born in 1835 in Gadian, India, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad remained dedicated to the study of the Holy Quran and to a life of prayer and devotion. Finding Islam the target of foul attacks from all directions, the fortunes of Muslims at a low ebb, faith yielding to doubt and religion only skin deep, he undertook a vindication and exposition of Islam, first in his epoch-making Brahine Ahmadiyya spread over four volumes. Islam, he said, was a living faith, and by following it, man could establish contact with his Creator and enter into communion with him. The teachings contained in the Holy Quran and the law promulgated by Islam were designed to raise man to moral, intellectual, and spiritual perfection. He announced that God had appointed him the Messiah as mentioned in the prophecies of the Bible and the Holy Quran. In 1889, he began to accept initiation into his community, which is now established in 137 countries and mosques all over the world. His 80 books are written mostly in Urdu, but some are in Arabic and Persian. After his demise in 1908, the Promised Messiah, Allah Salatu Wasalam, was succeeded by Hazard Malvi Nur Uddin Razianatala Anho, Khalifa al Messiah I. On the death of Hazard Malvi Nur Uddin Razialatala Anho in 1914, Hazard Mirza Bashir Uddin Mahmud Ahmed Razialatala Anho was also the promised Messiah's promised son, became Khalifa. Hazard Mirza Bashir Uddin Mahmud Ahmed Razialatala Anho remained in office for nearly 52 years. He died in 1965 and was succeeded by Hazrat Mirza Nasser Ahmed, Raziyatala Anho, a grandson of the founder. After 17 years of meritorious services, he passed away in 1982. His successor as Khalifa al Masih IV is Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmed, may God assist him, who also enjoys the distinction of being the grandson of the founder. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim The Will Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wassalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulahi Muhammadan Wa Alihi Wa Ashabihi Ajmain Translation All praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon his messenger, Muhammad, and upon all his companions and progeny. Since God Almighty has informed me the recurrent revelations, that the time of my demise is near. And since these revelations have been of such force as to shake me to the very core of my being, turn my heart cold to this life, I have deemed it appropriate to write a few words of admonition and advice for my friends and other such persons as my derived benefit from words. To begin with, I commit to writing the revelation which informed me of my impending demise and which thereby motivated me to undertake this task. The revelation, which was received in the Arabic language, is as follows. Translation Your departure from this world is imminent, and we shall leave no trace or sign of any matter that may be a cause of ignominy or infamy for you. Very little time remains of the ordained limit set for you by God, and we shall dispel all objections and will leave nothing behind that may be used to bring your name into disrepute. And we possess the power to either show you something of the prophecies we made concerning your opponents, or to cause you to die. You will die in such a state that I will be totally pleased with you. Your time has come, but clear and distinct signs of your endorsement will remain manifest forever. What has been promised to you is near. Describe to others the blessings that your God has bestowed on you. One who adopts piety, fear of Allah, and remains patient, Allah does not waste the reward of such devout people. It should be remembered that the Almighty God says here that He will not leave behind any such criticisms of my person as should prove a source of disgrace to me. This has two meanings. Number one, all objections published by my opponents 
for the sole purpose of bringing me into disrepute, shall be refuted and brought to naught. Number two, all those who do not refrain from their mischief, and who do not refrain from speaking ill of me, shall be wiped out of existence, and along with them their foul objections will be annihilated. Then Allah gave me the following tidings in Urdu about my demise. बहुत थोड़े दिन रह गए हैं इस दिन सब पर उदासी छा जाएगी ये होगा ये होगा बाद इसके तुम्हारा वाक्य होगा तमाम हवादस और अजायबात कुदरत दिखलाने के बाद तुम्हारा हादसा आएगा ट्रांसलेशन वेरी फ्यू डेज रिमेन ऑन दैट डे अ ग्रेट मेलनकॉली विल डिसेंड अपॉन ऑल दिस शेल हैपन दिस शेल हैपन दिस शेल हैपन देन आफ्टर दिस दाई इंसिडेंट विल कम टू पास Once all the tribulations and all the miracles of nature have been shown, then shall occur thy event. The knowledge that I have been given about the tribulations refers to the fact that death will grip the earth on all fronts. All around, earthquakes of such calamity will occur as to provide a foretaste of the last day. The land will be turned upside down and the lives of many will become harsh. Then those who repent and forsake sin to them Allah will show mercy Every prophet has given tidings of this day It is therefore incumbent that all this should come to pass But those who set their hearts aright be taking themselves to the paths that are pleasing to God they will have no occasion for fear or grief Addressing me God Almighty has said Thou art a warner from myself Indeed I sent you so that the sinners may be separated from the righteous. And he said, A warner came to this world and the world did not accept him. But God will accept him and God will establish the truth of his claims with mighty onslaughts. Footnote: Had the world opened its eyes, it would have seen that I appeared at the beginning of a century. Nearly 1/4 of the 14th century has elapsed. and in accordance with what has been written in the hadith after i made my claim a solar and lunar eclipse occurred during the same month of ramadan a plague has ravaged the land many earthquakes have struck and there are many more to follow alas those who took this world to their hearts refused to accept me and footnote and i shall bless you to the extent that kings will seek blessings from your garments And God informed me of another pending earthquake which will be of utmost severity. He said, "Again the spring came and once again the word of God was fulfilled." This means that another tremendous earthquake will occur, but the righteous will be protected from it. Become righteous therefore and fear God so that you may be saved. Fear God today that you may remain in peace on that day. Indeed the heavens and the earth will each bring forth their signs. but the ones who fear the lord will be saved god has told me that many misfortunes will occur many disasters will strike the earth some during my lifetime and some after i have gone and he will bless this movement with prosperity some at my own hand and some after my departure it has always been the way of god a way which he has demonstrated since the day he created mankind that he comes to the aid of his apostles and messengers and grants them predominance he has stated in the holy quran katab allah li aghl banna ana wa rusuli translation allah has decreed most surely i will prevail i and my messengers sura al mujadila chapter 58 verse 22 Prevalence or predominance in this context can be explained as follows It is the fervent desire of all prophets that arguments in favor of God become firmly established on the earth in such a manner that none should be able to refute them So with mighty signs God makes manifest their truth and at their hands he sows the seed of the righteousness which they wish to spread However He does not complete this mission at their hands. Instead, he causes them to die in such circumstances and at such a time when it would seem as if they had failed in their mission. 
This gives their opponents the opportunity to heap ridicule on them. But once these people have had their laugh, he shows another manifestation of his power and creates a set of circumstances that eventually lead to the fulfillment of those partially achieved aims. In short, his power is manifested twice. Number one, during the lifetime of his apostles and through their works, he shows the power of his hand. Number two, after the demise of his apostles, when their followers are subjected to various hardships, the enemy gains force and begins to think that the mission of the prophet has been fatally injured. They even begin to believe that the community of his followers will be destroyed. Even members of the movement fall prey to doubt, as if their backs had been broken. Some unfortunate ones take to the path of apostasy. Then, once again, God shows his power and his might, and he saves the faltering community. So, he who is steadfast to the last witnesses this miracle of God Almighty. This is similar to what happened at the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr, Raziyallahu anhu. The death of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was considered untimely, and many ignorant Bedouins turned apostate. The companions of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were consumed with grief. At that critical hour, Allah made Hazrat Abu Bakr, Raziyallahu ta'ala anhu, stand firm, and through him he once again showed a manifestation of his power. Islam was thus saved from annihilation, and his following promise was fulfilled, which said, وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّا لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي أَرْتَزَى لَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَا Translation And that he will surely establish for them their religion, which he has chosen for them, and that he will surely give them, in exchange, security and peace after their fear. Surah Al-Nur, Chapter 24, Verse 56 this is what happened at the time of Moses, alayhi salatu wasalam. Moses, alayhi salatu wasalam, died en route from Egypt to Canaan, and so did not reach his promised destination. The Israelites were grief-stricken. It is recorded in the Torah that they mourned for forty days at this apparently untimely death and at their unexpected separation from Moses. This happened at the time of Jesus Christ, alayhi wasalam. After the crucifixion, all his disciples dispersed, and one even turned apostate. So, dear friends, it has always been the way of God Almighty to show two manifestations of his power. He thereby demolishes two false joys of the opponents. It is impossible that he should now change this long-established divine practice. Grieve not, therefore, at what I am telling you. Nor should you be heartbroken, as you are destined to witness the second manifestation of his power. And this second manifestation will be better for you, as it is everlasting, and will remain unbroken until the day of judgment. And the second manifestation cannot occur until after I am gone. But once I have departed, God will bring about for you the second manifestation of his power, and it will remain with you forever. This is as promised by God and recorded in Brahina Amadiyya, a promise not for me personally, but for you. For God has said that his followers will be vouchsafed prevalence over others until the day of judgment. It is essential that the day of my separation from you should approach so that the day of God's everlasting promise may arrive. And our God is true to his word. He is sincere and he is true. He will show you all that he has promised. Albeit these are the days of the world, and many disasters are destined to occur. Yet it is inevitable that the world will remain in existence until God's decree is fulfilled. I came from God as a manifestation of his power. So gather together in prayer, and await the second manifestation. Righteous communities in every land 
should gather together and busy themselves in prayer, so that the second manifestation of power should descend from the heavens, and show you how mighty is your Lord. Consider your death to be near, for you do not know when its hour will approach. And after me, let the pure and righteous souls of the community accept bath, oath of allegiance, in my name. Footnote. Such persons will be selected by consensus of opinion among the believers. If forty believers agree on a particular individual, then he becomes entitled to accept bath in my name. And such a person should be an exemplar to others. God has informed me that a person from my own progeny will lead my followers. He will be granted distinction through divine revelation and nearness to God. And through him the truth will spread, and many will accept it. So wait for those days. And remember, such a one can only be recognized in the fullness of time. Before that time, he may appear to be an insignificant person. Or, on the basis of a misunderstanding, he may even seem objectionable, as indeed the most perfect man is at one time a mere seed or clot of blood in the mother's womb. I came from God as a manifestation of His power. It is God's wish that all people of pious nature, living in various parts of the world, regardless of whether they belong to Europe or Asia, be brought together under the banner of Tawhid, the unity of God. It is His intention that all His servants be gathered into one religion, and it is for the fulfillment of that goal that I have been sent into this world. So strive for that goal, but always with gentleness, high morals, and with prayers. And until such a time when one should stand up from among you with the Holy Spirit from the Lord, you should work together and cooperate with one another. And through solicitude for others, and by purifying your souls, you too should partake of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, true righteousness cannot be attained. Selfish desires should be forsaken, and to win the pleasure of Allah, you should elect to tread the narrowest of all paths. Do not be seduced by worldly pleasures as these take man away from God, and adopt a life of austerity that you may win the pleasure of Allah. The pain that pleases Allah is far better than the pleasure which angers Him, and the defeat that pleases Allah is far better than the victory which incurs his wrath. Forsake the love which brings you close to the wrath of God. If you come to him having purified your heart, then he will help you along all paths, and no enemy will be able to hurt you. You cannot win the pleasure of Allah until you forsake all your own joys and pleasures, your honor, your wealth, and your very life and you must adopt a life of such hardship as to be akin to death. But if you can bear this hardship, you will be gathered into the lap of God like a precious child, and you will become heir to the righteous ones who have gone before you. And the doors for every blessing will be open for you. Alas, there are but a few men of such stature. Allah has informed me that righteousness is a tree which should be planted in the heart. The water which nourishes righteousness does indeed feed the entire garden of life. Righteousness is a root. If it is dead, then all else is worthless. But while it lives, all else lives. What good can a man incur if, on the one hand, he professes to seek God, but on the other, he displays no resolve? I say to you in truth, that he whose faith is tainted with worldliness is ruined. All hell is very close to the one who does not devote himself entirely to God. Some of his intentions are for God, while some of them are worldly. So if your intentions have the slightest hint of worldliness, all your worship will be in vain. If such is the case, you are following not God, but Satan. And do not even think that God will come to your help if such be your state. In fact, if that is your condition, you are no better than the worms of the earth, and like them you too will soon perish. 
and God will not be in you. In fact, he would be pleased to bring about your ruin. But if your ego truly dies, then you will appear in God, and God will be with you. The home where you reside will be a blessed one. And God's mercy will descend upon the walls of your dwelling, and the town where such a person resides will be a blessed one. If your life and your death, your every movement, your gentleness and your anger are solely for God, and if during periods of hardship and distress you do not test God and you do not break off your relationship with Him, rather you move towards Him, then I say in truth you will become a most distinct people of His. You are a human just like myself, and my God and your God is the same. So do not waste your holy powers, and if you turn completely to God, then in accordance with divine will, I say unto you that you will become his elected people. Let the greatness and the glory of God sink deeply into your hearts. Declare his unity not only with your tongues, but also with your actions, so that he through his actions may show you his mercy and blessings. Guard against malice and show true compassion to all creation. Tread every path of virtue as you know not from which one you will be accepted. Glad Tidings The field for attaining nearness to God lies wide open. Every nation loves this world, and none pay heed to that which will win God's pleasure. This is a golden opportunity for those desirous of entering this door. Let them show their beauties and win divine favors. Do not think that God will let you go to waste. You are the seed of his hand, and God says that the seed which is planted in the earth will grow and flourish, and its branches will extend in all directions, and it will develop into a large tree. So blessed is he who has the true faith in God, and is not afraid of the trials and tribulations along the way. For trials and tribulations must come, so that God may distinguish between those who are true in their pledge of allegiance and those who are false. And whosoever falters when confronted with trials will not be able to harm God one iota. Misfortunes will plague him all the way to hell, and it would have been better for him had he not been born at all. But as for those who are steadfast till the last, they will be subjected to severe hardships and misfortunes. Other nations will mock them, and the world will be harsh towards them. They eventually will be victorious, and the doors of God's blessings will be open for them. Addressing me, God has said that I should announce the following to my community. Those who have entered into belief, a belief untainted by worldly considerations, and free from hypocrisy or cowardice, and a belief which does not fall short at any stage of obedience, such are the ones who find favor with God. And Allah says, they are the ones who tread the path of truth. Hearken, what does God desire of you? All he wants is that you become his. Do not associate partners with him, either earthly ones or heavenly ones. Our Lord is he who lives today as he lived before. He speaks today as he spoke before, and he listens today as he listened before. It is foolish to surmise that he listens but no longer speaks. The truth is, he listens and he speaks. All his attributes are eternal, without beginning and without end. None of his attributes have become obsolete, and never will they become so. He is the one without partner. He has no son and no spouse. He is unique. There is none like unto him. There is no person who can share in his unique attributes and there is none who is his equal. There is no one like him in his attributes, and his power never diminishes. He is near, yet he is far. He is far, yet he is near. For those gifted with divine communion, he manifests his being in some form of likeness to himself. But he has no body, and no shape, and no form. He stands above all, yet it cannot be said that there is another beneath him. He is in the heavens, 
but it cannot be said that he is not on this earth. He is the sum total of all perfect attributes, and he is the manifestation of all that is praiseworthy. He is the fountainhead of all that is good. He is the holder of all powers. He is the source of all blessings and the one to whom all things will ultimately return. He is the master of every realm and the author of all perfection. He is free from all defects and weaknesses. And he is the only one whom earthly and heavenly beings should worship. Nothing is impossible for him, and all souls and their powers and all particles and their powers are created by him. Nothing can become manifest without him, and he himself manifests his being through his power and his might and through his signs. And it is through these means that we can reach him. He always manifests himself to the righteous, and he shows them his powers. This is how he can be recognized, and this is how we can identify the paths that are favorable to him. He sees without physical eyes, he hears without physical ears, and he speaks without a physical tongue. Similarly, he can bring about a state of existence from a state of non-existence. In dreams, you experience a world that is created by God without any physical matter. In that world, he shows you things that do not exist or have been destroyed as though they were physically present. Thus to him belong all powers. Ignorant is he who denies God's might. Blind is he who remains oblivious to the profoundness of his powers. He can and he does all things without breaking his divine law and his word. He is alone in his being, and in his attributes, in his deeds, and in his powers. And all doors to him are closed, save one, and that is the one opened by the Holy Quran. And it is no longer necessary to follow the various prophethoods and scriptures that have gone before as the prophethood of Muhammad embraces them all. Again, with the exception of this one, all paths to him are closed. All the truths that take one to God are found within the Quranic teachings. No new truth will come after it, and there was no truth before it which it does not contain. Hence, all previous prophethoods are sealed with the prophethood of Muhammad, and this is how it should be. Anything that has a beginning must have an end. However, the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, is not lacking in its beneficence. In fact, it is the most bountiful of all prophethoods. The simplest way of attaining God's nearness is to follow this prophethood. Obedience to it wins greater gifts of divine love and divine communion than ever before. A perfect follower of this teaching should not be called a prophet alone, as that would be an affront to the perfect prophethood of Muhammad But of course, the perfect follower can be called an Amati, follower, and a prophet together, and this will not be a slight to the perfect prophethood of Muhammad Rather, it would add to its luster. Footnote. In spite of this, it should be remembered that after Muhammad, the door for the law-bearing prophethood has been firmly closed. And after the Quran, no new scripture which adds to, supersedes, or cancels its commandments will be revealed. For the ministry of the Quran lasts until the day of judgment. End footnote. And when divine communion reaches a stage of perfection, both in terms of quality and quantity, when it becomes free of impurities and defects, and when it clearly comprehends the unseen, that in other words can be termed as prophethood. All the prophets agree on this. The followers of Muhammad وسلم, have been described as Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Translation You are the best people raised for the good of mankind. Surah Al Imran, Chapter 3 verse 111 They have also been taught the prayer 
اہدن سرات المستقیم سرات الزین انمتا علیہم ٹرانسلیشن گائے سن دا رائٹ پاتھ دا پاتھ آف دوز آن ہوم داؤ ہیز بیسٹ او دائی بلیسنگس سور الفاتیا چیپٹر ون ورس سکس تھرو سیون It is not possible that a nation which has been described thus, and which has been taught the above prayer, should be entirely deprived of the status of prophethood. If so, then the Ummah of Muhammad wasallam, would be deemed imperfect and incomplete, with all members wandering blindly. Moreover, it would cast a shadow on the Holy Prophet's munificence, and his ability of purifying hearts of his followers would seem weak and defective. Further, the prayer which Muslims say in their five daily prayers would become meaningless. However, had it been possible for an individual to attain the rank of prophethood directly without following the light of Muhammad وسلم, then the term Khatam of Nawwat, seal of the prophets, becomes meaningless. So, to avoid both these dangers, Allah bestowed the honor of perfect, pure, and holy communion on those individuals whose love of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was of the highest degree. No barrier remained between them and their Prophet. They reached a degree of excellence and perfection in their obedience to the Holy Prophet وسلم, so much so that they lost themselves in him. and he in turn was reflected in their rapture. And they, like prophets before, were bestowed with the most excellent and perfect communion with God. This is how some individuals, despite being followers, have earned the title of prophet. Such prophethood is not distinct from the prophethood of Muhammad, In fact, on close consideration, we find it that it is none other than the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, adorned in a new glory. This is what is meant by the words chosen by the Holy Prophet وسلم, when he referred to the Messiah and Mahdi. He said, He would be a prophet and a follower. Hence, there is no place for an outsider at this rank of eminence. Blessed is he who comprehends this point, that he may save himself from destruction. God caused Jesus Christ, Allah Salatu Wasalam, to die. The following clear and lucid verse of the Quran bears witness to this fact. Translation Since thou didst cause me to die, thou hast been the watcher over them. Surah Al Maidah Chapter 5, verse 118. This means that on the day of judgment, God will ask Jesus, alas, salatu wa salam, whether he commanded his followers to worship him and his mother. Jesus will reply, I was witness over them as long as I remained among them, but I do not know how they erred after you caused me to die. Now, if one wants, one can translate, Falamma tawafaytani as when thou didst cause me to die. Or one can stubbornly stick to the mistaken notion that it means, when you raise me with my original body to heaven. Either way, the verse proves that Jesus Christ will not return to this world. For if he returns before the day of judgment and breaks the cross, then being a prophet of God, it would not be possible for him to utter such a manifest untruth in the presence of his Lord. How will he be able to say, I had no knowledge that after my death my followers went astray and took me and my mother for God? A man returns to this world. He lives here for forty years, and he opposes the Christians. He is also a prophet of God. How then can he possibly utter the despicable untruth that I know nothing of what they did? So this verse prevents Jesus from entering the world again. And if he does, he will have to be branded as a dishonest person. Now if he lives with his material body in the heavens, and this verse is preventing his return to earth, will he then die in the heavens? Is that where his coffin will be located? 
but that would contradict the verse. Fiha tumutun. Translation: Therein shall you die. Surah Al Araf, chapter seven, verse twenty-six. Hence, this proves that he did not make a bodily ascension to heaven, but that he died here on earth. Now, when the Book of Allah has, with such perfect clarity, given its verdict on this matter, is it not then a sin to contradict that verdict? Had I not come, such misinterpretations could have been forgiven. But now that I have come from God, and the true meanings of the Holy Quran have been made clear, failure to give up these erroneous views shows insincerity of faith. God's signs in my favor. Have been shown on the earth and in the heavens. Nearly one quarter of the century has elapsed. Thousands of signs have been manifested, and the age of the world has reached its seventh millennium. What kind of hard-heartedness is it to still not accept the truth? Pay heed! I announce in a loud voice that God's signs have not yet been exhausted. I was warned long before the event of the earthquake. That struck on fourth April, nineteen o five. Now God has informed me that another calamitous earthquake will strike during the spring season. It will occur during the spring, but I do not know whether its time will be at the start of the season when the first blossoms are on the trees, mid-season, or at the end of the season. The words of the revelation are as follows: Spring came again. And the word of God was once again fulfilled, as the first earthquake occurred during the season of spring. So God has informed me that the second one will also take place in the same season. As some trees start to blossom at the end of January, the danger period is January till the end of May. Footnote: I do not know whether the spring referred to is the forthcoming one, or whether the time for the fulfillment of this prophecy. Is the spring of another year. In any case, the words of God suggest that it will occur during the season of spring, whether this one or some future one. God has told me that He will come like one who comes stealthily in the pitch of the night. End footnote. And God said, "Zilzilat the saat," meaning the earthquake will be a foretaste of the last day. And then He said. Laka nara ayatin vanadam ma ya murun, meaning, we will show signs in your favor, and we will demolish the edifices that are being constructed. Then he said, an earthquake came, and it came with great severity. The world was turned upside down. In other words, a fierce earthquake will come, and it will turn some parts of the land upside down. This is similar to what happened at the time of Lot. Then he said, "Inni mal afwaja atika baktatan." Translation: I will come stealthily with my legions. No one knows when. At the time of Lot, no one was aware of the imminent earthquake until the whole township had been turned upside down. All were eating, drinking, and making merry when suddenly the ground under their feet was turned upside down. God says the same will happen here as sin has crossed all bounds. And man's love for this world is excessive, and the ways of the Lord are viewed with disdain. Then he said, "The end of lives." Addressing me, he said, "Kala Rabbo ka inna hu nazilo minas samae, ma yurzi ka rahmatam manna wa kana amran makzia." Translation: Your Lord proclaims that something will descend from the heavens, and it will be pleasing to thee. This is a mercy from us. This is decreed, and right from the beginning of time, it was destined to occur. It is essential the heavens will hold back from sending it, that which will be pleasing, until this prophecy has been widely publicized among various peoples. Who then has faith in what we say, other than the fortunate ones? Remember. This proclamation is not made with the intention of spreading fear and apprehension. Rather, it is made so that the people may make safeguards against such fear, and so that none should be destroyed in a state of ignorance. All actions are linked to the intentions behind them. 
Our intention is not to inflict pain, but to prevent suffering. The one who repents will be saved from God's punishment, but the unfortunate one, the one who does not repent, who does not refrain from attending assemblies where divines are made the subject of mockery, who does not eschew evil and sin, the day of his destruction is nigh. This is because his imprudence is reprehensible in the sight of God. It is worth mentioning here that, as I pointed out before, God has informed me of my impending demise. As regards my life, he addressed me in saying, Very few days remain. And he said, After all the tribulations and miracles of nature have been shown, the time of your demise will come. This points to the fact that before my demise, certain tribulations will take place, and certain miracles of nature will be shown. So the world should be prepared for a revolution, following which my demise will occur. The sight from my grave has been shown to me. I saw an angel measuring the land. On reaching a certain spot, he told me that this was the place for my grave. Then I was shown a grave that shone brighter than silver, and its earth was of silver. Then it was said to me, This is your grave. I was shown a place called Bahishti Makbara, Heavenly Graveyard. It was made plain to me that it contained the graves of the heavenly elders of the community. Since that time, I have been concerned that the community should purchase a small piece of land to serve as a graveyard. But as the most suitable pieces of land command very high prices, this aim has lain suspended for a long period of time. But now, following the death of our friend Malvi Abdul Karim, and in view of the recurring divine revelations that I receive about my own death, I deem it appropriate that arrangements for a cemetery be made as soon as possible. For this purpose, I am donating a portion of my land which adjoins our gardens. Its price is not less than 1,000 rupees. I pray that Allah may bless it, and that he may make it a heavenly graveyard. May it be the last resting place for the pure-hearted people of this Jamaat, the ones who truly give precedence to religion over worldly matters, the ones who forsake the love of this world and become totally devoted to God, who brought about the pious changes in themselves, and who, like the companions of the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa sallam, were exemplary in their loyalty and in their truthfulness. Amen, O Lord of all the worlds. I pray again, O my mighty God, make this land a graveyard for those pure-hearted people of my Jamaat, who have truly become devoted to Thee, the ones whose enterprises are not tainted by worldly considerations. Amen, O Lord of all the worlds. And I pray for a third time, O my mighty and honorable Lord, the most forgiving and ever merciful God, give room in this burial ground to only those who have true faith in this messenger, the ones who hold no rancor or selfish motives, and who are not mistrustful or suspicious of others. Footnote. It is fatal to be mistrusted or suspicious of others. Mistrust or suspicion burns faith just as fire burns hay. God becomes the enemy of whosoever treats his messengers with mistrust, and he is ever ready to do battle against them. God holds such a high sense of honor for his apostles that the like of it cannot be found elsewhere. When I was attacked from various directions, God's honor was aroused in my favor. He said, Translation I stand by my apostle and I chastise those who seek to rebuke him, and I will bestow on you that which will last forever. You hold an exalted station in the heavens and among people of vision and foresight. We will manifest signs for your sake, and we will demolish whatever they fabricate. And they said, Wilt thou create what shall cause disorder in it? He said that I have knowledge of what you are unaware. Surely I will disgrace whosoever has any intention to humiliate you. Have no fear. Verily, apostles have nothing to be afraid of, 
as I am with them. Decree from Allah has come, therefore do not show any haste about it. Glad tidings are given to the apostles. O oh, my Ahmad, you are my pleasure and you are with me. You are as precious to me as is my integrity and my uniqueness. You hold such rank with me that mortals cannot understand. You have eminence in my presence, and I have chosen you for myself. When you are incensed, then I am incensed, and whatever you cherish is cherished by me. Allah has conferred on you prominence over everything. All praise belongs to Allah, who caused you to be the Messiah, son of Mary. No one can question what he does, while well, they will be asked to account for what they do. And this is a promise that is destined to be fulfilled. Allah shall safeguard you from your enemies, and he shall attack anyone who attacks you. This is because they are disobedient and transgressors. Is Allah not sufficient enough for his servant? O mountains and ye birds, exalt and glorify Allah with him. Allah has decreed, that surely my apostles and I shall overcome all, and after a setback, they will be victorious. Verily, Allah is with those who adopt piety, and they are the benefactors. Surely, those who believe, they have a perfect rank of honor with their Lord. Peace will be the greeting conveyed to them from their ever-merciful God, and O oh, you guilty ones, this day, separate yourselves from the righteous. And footnote, who fulfill the requirements of faith and obedience. Those who have, to all intents and purposes, sacrificed themselves in that cause. The ones with whom you are pleased, and who you know to be totally lost in their love for thee. Who with loyalty, fullest respect, and open faith maintain a relationship of love and total dedication to your messenger. Amen, O Lord of all the worlds. I have been given great tidings about this graveyard. God has not only said that it is heavenly, but he has also said, Unzila fiha kullo rahmatin, meaning every kind of mercy is descending upon it. There is no kind of mercy which the people buried here will not partake of. So, through subtle revelations, God has made my heart inclined to imposing certain conditions for burial here. Only those who, because of their truthfulness and perfect righteousness, fulfill all these conditions, shall be allowed burial in this graveyard. There are three conditions, all equally binding. Number one. I have donated the present plot of land as a contribution from myself. To complete this project, more land, costing approximately 1,000 rupees, will be purchased. Trees will be planted to make it pleasant, and a well is to be built. There is a body of stagnant water to the north of the cemetery. Therefore, a bridge has to be constructed to afford passage to the cemetery. To meet these miscellaneous expenditures, a further 2,000 rupees is required. Hence, a total of 3,000 rupees is needed to complete this project. So, the first condition is, Anyone wishing to be buried in this graveyard should, in accordance with his means, make monetary contributions to meet these expenses. Such contributions should only be taken from people who want to be buried here, not from others. For the present, these contributions should come to our respected brother, Hazard Malvi Nuruddin. However, should God so wish, this scheme will continue even after all of us have passed away. In that event, an Anjuman, executive body, will be required. The money collected will, at the discretion of the executive, be spent to publicize the message of Islam and to propagate the unity of God. Number two. The second condition is, only those members of the Jamaat will be buried here who leave a will stipulating that one-tenth of their property is left to the Ahmadiyya movement. The Ahmadiyya movement will use that property in its work of disseminating the message of Islam and propagating the teachings of the Holy Quran. The truthful and the perfect of faith 
will have the option of donating more, should they so desire, but not less than one-tenth. The funds will be administered by an executive body. The executive will consist of honest and learned people. They, through mutual consultation and in accordance with the guidelines mentioned herein, will use the funds for the advancement of Islam, for the dissemination of Quranic knowledge, for the publication of other books and on religious teachers. God has promised that he will cause this community to flourish. It is therefore expected that abundance of funds will be forthcoming for the propagation of Islam. All matters concerned with the propagation of Islam, it would be premature to go into details here, will be paid for out of these funds. And when a party responsible for the discharge of these duties passes away, their successors will be obliged to carry on the same tasks as per the instructions of the Ahmadiyya movement. Further, the orphans, the poor, and the new converts to this movement, whose means of livelihood are limited, may have a share in these funds. And it is permissible that the funds be augmented through trade and commerce. Do not think that these are distant conjectures. Rather, this is the will of the Mighty One, the Sovereign of the heavens and the earth. Where will the money come from? And how will such a community be born? a community of people willing to perform heroic feats for their faith? These are not the questions that worry me. I am more concerned that the people coming after me may stumble when entrusted with such large amounts of wealth and that they may take to the love of this world. So I pray that the Ahmadiyya movement may always be blessed with trustees who will toil for their Lord. It would be lawful for those of them who do not have their own means of livelihood to be given money out of the funds to help with their expenses. Number three. Third condition. A person aspiring to burial in the cemetery should be righteous. He should abstain from all things unlawful. He should not indulge in shirk, associating partners with God, or bidat, harmful innovations and he should be a sincere and straightforward Muslim. Number four. For the righteous person who owns no property and is unable to make financial sacrifices, if it can be shown that his life was dedicated to the cause of his faith and that he was righteous, then he may be buried in this graveyard. Instructions. Number one. Any will made in accordance with the above-mentioned conditions shall be executed only after the demise of the testator. However, it is incumbent that the will be made during one's lifetime and entrusted to the appointed trustee of the Ahmadiyya movement. It should also be published. This is because it is usually very difficult to make a proper bequest at the time of death. And as the days of heavenly signs and trials are nigh, anyone making a will during a period of relative security holds a very high rank in the sight of Allah. And as the testator's wealth will render ongoing benefits, so the reward he earns will too be ongoing, and his bequest will come under the definition of ongoing alms. Number two. If a person fulfills these conditions, but dies at a place far from Qadian, in another part of the country, his heir should bring his corpse to Qadian in a strong wooden box. If a person is eligible for burial here, dies before the graveyard is complete, meaning before the bridge, etc., is constructed, his corpse should be placed in a box and buried, in trust, near the place of his death. Then, when all arrangements for the graveyard are finalized, his corpse should be brought here. But it would not be appropriate to exhume the grave of one whose corpse was not placed in a strong wooden box at the time of burial. Footnote lest anyone be inclined to think otherwise this graveyard and the arrangement for it are not bidat harmful innovations it should be remembered that this scheme is being undertaken in accordance with divine revelation no human motives are involved in it and do not think that it is the cemetery which makes one heavenly this land cannot make anyone heavenly no what the word of god means 
is that only the heavenly will be afforded burial here. End footnote. Let it be made clear, God intends that all those of perfect faith be buried in one place. This is so that the future generations may see them in one location, and thereby rejuvenate their own faith. And it is so that the noble deeds which they perform for the sake of God may always be known to the people. In the end, we pray that God Almighty may extend His succor in this task to all sincere people, that He may create in them a fervor for their faith, and that their end may be a noble one. Amen. All members of the Jamaat who receive this treatise should convey its message to their friends and acquaintances. As far as possible, they should also have it published and safeguarded for their future generations. Opponents, too, should be informed of it in a seemly manner. Again, be steadfast at the evil utterances of the abusive people, and busy yourself in prayer. And in the end, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, December twentieth, 1905 Translation of Poetic Verses Written in Urdu You are wise and watchful, my friend by nature pure. Beware, therefore, and take the utmost care, that in your greed for the things of this material world, you do not throw to the winds your due regard for deen, that you do not forget your spiritual needs. Do not let your heart become entangled in this temporary and perishable abode. For underneath its joys and comforts lie concealed one hundred harms and woes. If only you can hear, the voice from the grave is clear. It says, in a few days you will become my prey. So it would be well the less you grieve for mundane affairs. For indeed, whosoever involves himself in these low cares, all that he gains is pain and suffering. And he is surely delivered who goes through life mindful of the time of his death. And whosoever cuts himself away from this world, his eyes remain firmly fixed on the right path. Even before the long journey, which begins with death, he commences his journey to God, and he pulls out from this world everything he has. For this voyage to the ultimate home, he tightens his belt, and leaves everything behind that belongs to this home so weak and unreliable. The affairs of this life being matters which lie concealed, it is best that a man completely withdraw his heart from it. The hell of which the Holy Quran has given us tidings. Tis none other than this greed for the things of this world, since at last one needs must, in any case, say farewell to it. And since one of these days, every one of us must betake himself to the long journey. It ill behoves a wise man that he should let his heart be tied down to a garden of which the blooms are subject to withering autumn. At any time and every time to fall for this old hag, it is a grievous fault indeed, for she is a manifest enemy of Dean, of true and of purity. No one gains anything at all by being enamored of this two-faced sweetheart. For sometimes she destroys by peaceful means, and sometimes by means of war. Why indeed do you not fall in love with a sweetheart, with thoughtful tender care who will deliver you from all kinds of chains? Go and give some thought. To the matter your end shall come, and listen to old Sadi, if you will not listen to me. The morning over thy death shall be blessed with joy as though it were a wedding, provided the end comes when you are in a state of perfect righteousness. Appendix There are certain important points to note about this treatise, the will. These are listed below. Until the executive body, set up for administering the affairs of the cemetery, declares that all necessary arrangements have been finalized no corpse will be brought here for burial. The construction of the bridge must be completed and other arrangements finalized
before any burial can take place. Until that time, corpses should be placed in boxes and temporarily buried in other graveyards. Number two. Anyone wishing to abide by the conditions laid down herein should, while still of sound mind, commit his intentions to writing in the presence of two reliable witnesses. The will should also be entrusted to the care of the executive. The testator should clearly state that he bequeaths one-tenth of his fixed and movable assets to the Ahmadiyya movement to be used in the propagation of Islam and it is essential that his will be published in at least two newspapers. Number three, it is incumbent that the executive, after fully satisfying itself on the legal and Islamic validity of the will, issue the testator with a signed and sealed certificate. And when burial is requested in this cemetery, as per the above-mentioned rules and regulations, the certificate should be produced before the executive. The corpse will be buried under the supervision of the executive at the location it selects for this purpose. Number four. Other than in exceptional cases, as proposed by the executive, no child will be buried in the cemetery. This is because all children are heavenly. Further, the kith and kin of one buried here is not entitled to burial in this graveyard merely on the basis of that relationship. The person must, in his own right, fulfill all the requirements as stated in the treatise, the will. Number five. The corpse of a person who dies at a place other than Kadian should not be brought here unless it is in a box. And the executive should be informed of the intention to do so at least one month in advance so that it may overcome any temporary problems that may have arisen. The executive will extend permission for burial once all problems have been cleared. Number six. Should, God forbid, a person fulfilling all the conditions stated in the will die of plague, then his corpse should be placed in a strong box and temporarily buried elsewhere for a period of at least two years. The corpse can be brought to Gaudian after a period of two years has elapsed, and at such a time when the place of his death and Gaudian are both free from the plague. Number seven. Remember, it is not sufficient to merely bequeath one-tenth of one's fixed and movable assets. It is essential that a person making a will should, to the best of his abilities, abide by the Islamic teachings. He should strive in the ways of righteousness and piety. He should be a Muslim who believes firmly in the unity of God. He should have true faith in God's apostle, and he should not be the usurper of others' rights. Number eight. If a person bequeaths one-tenth of his assets to the Jamaat, but then, for example, he dies by drowning, or he dies in a foreign country from where it is difficult to bring his corpse, his will remains valid. As far as God is concerned, he is as good as buried in this cemetery. It will be lawful to erect a headstone in his memory with a suitable epitaph inscribed on it. The headstone may be of brick or of stone. Number 9. The executive responsible for the funds thus raised will not be permitted to spend it for purposes other than those of the Ahmadiyya movement. And of those purposes, the most important one is the propagation of Islam. And if the executive reaches a consensus, it will be permissible for them to augment the funds through trade and commerce. Number 10. All members of the executive should belong to the Ahmadiyya movement. They should be pious in nature and honest. Should it at any time be felt that a certain member is not of pious nature or that he is dishonest, or that he is a schemer, or that he is tainted with worldliness, then it is the duty of the executive to expel him immediately. Another person should be appointed in his place. Number 11. If the bequeathed assets are disputed, then any costs incurred in settling the dispute will be met from the funds